What's up, guys? It is Friday, July 30th, 2021. And this week, I have returning guest, Angela McCardle. Angela is a delight to have on the program every time she comes on, uh, which is, this is the second time now. But I'm telling you, it was delightful. Twice delightful. Had her on back in uh, December of last year, I believe it was. Uh, we talked a lot about uh, the Libertarian Party and the direction it needs to go then. A lot of crazy stuff happened between then and now. And she's back to talk about even more in her Libertarian, uh, in her run for Libertarian National Committee. Uh, chairperson, chairman, what, chairman, woman, chairwoman, chairperson, chair. She's running for Libertarian National Party chair. And she needs to get in that seat, in my humble opinion. Uh, so, rather than uh, rather than go on about a, a bunch of different subjects, because we covered a lot of those subjects in our discussion, we talk about COVID, we talk about vaccine mandates, we talk about vaccines in general, we talk about health and wellness, and we talk about, most importantly, growing the libertarian movement, libertarian solutions to problems that the government seemingly can't solve, and also, just building communities. Things that are lacking in today's America. So get ready. Tighten your seatbelts. Because here we go. Angela McArdle, round two. Angela McArdle, welcome back to the FritzCast. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me back. I'm a little, I'm a little low energy today because it's it's one of those days in Southern California that's really hot and, you know, poor me. I live on the beach and I don't have air conditioning. So I have to suffer, fourteen or fifteen days out of the year. Today is one of those days. Shoot, is it like a hundred plus degrees or is it just humid or what? I don't know. It's probably like eighty something degrees. It's probably like eighty degrees in my house. So it's that's probably a. 90 yeah. outside yeah it's, that's uh, you know i don't know how you do that i'd be a, i'd be a freaking snowman puddle on the floor right oh <laughs> i'd way rather sweat than shiver you know wow we are polar opposites on that angela i would rather just sit in a freezer <laughs> no no not for me i i really you know california sucks i know it sucks but we still got the weather now if if progressives figure out how to destroy the weather as they are trying really hard to do right now, you know, then, then I'll have to officially say there's nothing good about California, but right now I still got the weather. At least you have that. At least you have that. And you, you guys lead recall elections, I think. Yeah, we'll see what happens. I keep getting emails and text message blasts saying that the recall is tied neck and neck right now in all the polls. Oh yeah. Well, I mean, that's what, you know, random conservative think tanks and campaigns are saying, but, <laughs> I, you know, it's very interesting how they're relying on polls and you know, I, I don't want to discourage anyone from obviously trying to get rid of the, the horrendous dictator we have, but they, these are the same people who also believe that the election was stolen and, and that you, they have no faith in the electoral process. So I'm very curious how that's going to turn out in California. Personally, I'm not optimistic. I think we're going to have rampant cheating in the California recall election. But, you know, I'm going to vote out this uh, blood-sucking scumbag, uh, you know, and hope for the best. One way or another. Yeah. So that's that's an interesting bit. I, I, I didn't even think I would uh, – I didn't even think I'd be asking you about it. But uh, California is kind of unique in that uh, – what, there must be a, a dozen or more candidates running in this thing, right? There were 27 who had qualified statewide last I checked, no, or maybe just 27 Republicans. Now that's nothing. When Arnold Schwarzenegger ran, uh, what was that? It was like 2001, I voted in that election. And there were over 100 people, I think, on the ballot. So wow, it's, it's a lot of vanity campaigns. Yeah. Don't feel bad. So like libertarians who run paper ballot, you know, paper candidate things, guess what? So does everyone else. So don't feel too bad on yourself if you ran a crap campaign, because I guarantee you there's like hundreds of crap campaigns in California all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Who, who's the um, who's the, we, you have a libertarian running for. We do. It is our very own Riverside County Supervisor Jeff Hewitt. He is running and the party has officially endorsed him. And that's who I'll be voting for. And 
we've done a little bit of campaigning for him. Well, more than a little bit, I guess, but hoping to help with, um, with a campaign event for him next month in San Diego. Okay. Well, that's good. No, that, 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 that is good. And you've been, you've been traveling around a lot these past uh, couple of weeks or a couple of months, actually. Um, what, you've kind of gotten this vibe you've gone to you've been going to a lot of libertarian state conventions and uh, other events we actually met when you came here in delaware uh because you were at liberty speaks and you were at our lp convention as well uh which had its own fiasco of sorts but uh <laughs> boy did it yep yep yeah i got some things to say about that well hey at, have at it right now if you want so, you know, it's really interesting that the Mises Caucus gets, uh, we have these really stupid rumors that are just based in nothing. That's just people who hate us and they want to just throw random insults like bigot or Republican infiltrator. Right, right. You want to ruin the party. You want to take it over and make it something else. Mm-hmm. So what happened in Delaware is you got this guy on the board who completely aside from the fact that he, uh, possibly try to block people from voting remotely. And there was all kinds of shenanigans and not following their bylaws, which is shameful, shameful cheating behavior that libertarians should not engage in. The guy started a competing political party. And then I hear that, you know, other people on the executive committee in Delaware don't think there's a problem with it. And you got the Mises caucus over here screaming, that's not okay. That's a huge conflict of interest. You can't be on the executive committee while you're supporting another political party like what on earth yep so you know i i'm very hopeful that the delaware lp will be in you know better shape next year than because that's not i know that a lot of people are fired up about it and that is just not an okay thing to do when you're the leader of a political organization in california uh we're not allowed to endorse anyone in another political party yeah, that's in our bylaws. And I wouldn't, you know, like there's cool people who run, like I've had f- friends who run as Republicans or no party preference, or even sometimes Democrats. And I have to be like, Hey man, like I wish you the best of luck, but I can't uh, endorse you in my capacity. And I, have to, I take that pretty seriously. Yeah. And by the same standard, I, I would think that it's not okay to champion another freaking political party. So it's just like, you know, the double standard is, is pretty gross. You got rumor mongering about something that people aren't actually doing. Meanwhile, the people who are rumor mongering are the ones doing it, engaging in, in bad faith with other political parties. And we've had it in California too. I get so frustrated. People, you know, scream, all right, bigot, Republican infiltrator. But then meanwhile, they're the ones who are endorsing Republican and Democrat candidates. Yeah, yeah. So, it's it's a hairy territory, and uh, unfortunately, uh, with what happened with uh, where was it New Hampshire? Correct. Yeah. I hope I'm not. Yeah. Okay. I remember I had Justin O'Donnell talking about New Hampshire uh, pretty extensively um, mm-hmm. on an episode. Uh, as we can see, the Libertarian Party, um, in many different state levels, has a lot of crap going on. Yep. Yep. Justin's a solid dude. What happened in New Hampshire was just absolutely outrageous. And like, it really shows that the culture of the Libertarian Party at the national level is a huge problem. Yeah. It's like, if we can't support our state affiliates, if you got, and I don't want to hear how, oh, we shouldn't rush to conclusions. We should, that is not appropriate because the facts of the matter were that someone did something illegal not according to the bylaws. They took information away from the state party and basically shut the state party out and admitted the whole thing and admitted that they were trying to start their own counterparty. That's not okay. This isn't complicated, right? Like you would think I, I it's don't, not. I don't think that you we need to wait and see and screw over a state affiliate while we argue about what kind of investigation to take. It's just if someone violates the rules, bam, you know. If they go rogue, you you rectify that like immediately. That's we really got to change the culture at the at the national party. We really do. It needs to be libertarian. <laughs> yeah, 
No, absolutely it does. And this, this I believe, plays into why you're running for, for LNC chair. When we, when we last talked yeah. about this, we, I, think we, I think we talked in like December, and not all this stuff had unraveled. And now, right. it's like, now it's like a whole different playing field almost. Yeah. It, you know, and I've been to all these state conventions and most of them have been really great. They have been really positive experiences. They've been very, like, it's really like edifying and exciting to see all the progress that people are doing and all of the new growth that the Mises Caucus is driving into the parties and how a lot of people, especially like older people of the party are receptive to it and they're excited. Yeah. But when I went to Delaware and I saw that like people were cheating and trying to figure out ways to game the system and that other people in the party who'd been around a long time were just letting it happen, I was really disgusted. And there were people at the national level who, you know, were peripherally involved. At least they must have been aware of it. They were present and had nothing to say. Yeah, that's Dude. pretty crazy. Yeah. It's pretty it's crazy. It's just like it's like um, it's a reflection of mainstream culture that we think that like the truth is irrelevant. We're just going to do it. might equals right. If I can cheat, if I can con people, if I can scam my way into power, I'll do it. And obviously, that's what we see Democrats do. We saw it, you know, further back in George Bush Jr.'s contested election in Florida. It happened there, and we see the LP engaging in the same behavior. Anybody yeah. who does that needs to go. Yeah. Yeah, I my argument was that uh, we're trying to argue that we're the party of principle, yet here we are doing the same shady businesses, and it's like, well, what's the difference? Right, yeah. Principles should matter, and we should not be screwing over new people who are excited to join the party, especially when you really haven't been doing much. Like, the reality is not every, but a lot of these state parties, like, they don't have a lot going on, and then they get a... Uh, an injection of like new excited people and people with like very important skill sets and then they're like oh no you're going to disrupt my social club and they scream and throw fit and do everything they can to block new growth like that's insane it doesn't achieve liberty like the purpose of the libertarian party isn't just to win elections the statement of principle says we challenge the cult of the omnipotent state that's right. that's pretty intense right so that doesn't say we try to mirror ourselves like the omnipotent state <laughs> no 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 that's not how you should behave no and then more to your point i don't understand why you would be scared or frightened by potential new growth right and furthermore i like they're they're clearly not thinking on the level of I could tell you, I could tell you how I felt going to the Delaware State Convention and then yeah. being told, oh, hey, um, no, you can't vote on, on the county level. We'll let you vote in the state level. We'll let you get away with that one. But the county level, no. And it was we like, we can't let you. Yeah, we can't let you vote because we made up some random rules that say you can't vote. Oh, OK. Can you point to me in the organization's bylaws, organizing documents, anything of that nature that says, no, it's just our rule. That is literally not how politics or any organization with voting rights works. Oh, yeah, no. And then suddenly the bylaws that were drafted uh, 11 years ago. Oh, hey, we found them. Apparently these weren't relevant enough to go over every year, but we found them now 11 years old, also stating nothing. Right. <laughs> and if all. that's the case, then whoever's in charge is incompetent and shouldn't be in charge because you should know your bylaws organizations. You should know where they are, that they exist. You should be familiar with them. So many arguments to just like gut half of that board, goodbye. And I hope that it happens. And I am trying to work to help you guys grow in Delaware on social media and looking for Delaware libertarians and just trying to pump up those numbers. So I'm optimistic no, in no, spite I'm of the shenanigans. I'm optimistic as well, just because I see, I see this, this passion and this energy that's rolling in like before I was, you know, I wasn't wholly active on a local level. So I have to, you know, bad Fritz there, but I decided to step up and take those steps to be active. And 
you know, I don't think that when somebody decides to do that, you, you should fault them or shame them. You should be welcoming to them. Right. Especially right. if, you know, Hey, we've had this dude on the national level voting for at least, you know, libertarian presidential candidates or what have you. Now he wants to be on the local. Now he's paying attention to what's happening in the backyard. And that's where the real important groundwork can be tackled. Yeah. Especially since Delaware does have some stuff like, when I was there in June, you guys did have some serious uh, things coming down the pipeline with state legislation, you know, like um, laws that were going to further infringe gun rights. Yep. It's, there's no time to be gatekeeping new people. It's just if somebody cares about freedom and individual rights, we need to let them in and we need to work together. Yeah, no, 100 percent. And I would argue that. Well, I've been arguing this for the last couple of months that now is it's like now more than ever is the time to to capitalize on these things. One yeah. of the biggest critiques you had in last episode was that LP National was not vocal enough in being upfront about the pandemic, the lockdowns, the restrictions, the mandates, all of it. Still, yep. to this day, still not at the forefront uh, driving this point. And now we have things, this is crazy. Joe Biden just came out today, just hours ago, all federal, all civilians, federal workers are either going to have to prove that they're vaccinated or be masked up and subject to like weekly testing. At the same time that the news is saying the stuff doesn't even work. It's complete like insanity, complete madness. Yeah. I hope that we can get some statements actually. Yeah. We'll see. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I think, I think that the, the new communications director, Larissa, whose last name all of a sudden escapes me. It starts with a G. I think that she's a little bit better than the people who ran communications in the past and she seems more receptive. So, you know, hopefully, hopefully. I know that Karen Ann Harlos and Joshua Smith and Stephen Akela, and there's, you know, like Eric Rodsep, there's a handful of, of really solid people on the board. Mm -hmm. I think that they are going to probably be supportive of speaking out against this stuff. It really is going to be like medical apartheid. And, you know, if, if you're offended that I used that term, but you're not offended about mandatory vaccinations, your values are just really wrong. Yeah. And, and that, that more so, I was shocked by it today just because now that, that, now that Biden has done this, now it becomes, well, the federal government did it. They opened the door. And now the floodgates can open for the states, yep. for the businesses, you know, now it's not, you know, Hey, that's a private business. They can do what they want. Now it's, you know, the, it's been greenlit. Yeah. To and it, before Biden said it, Gavin Newsom had already come out and said that he was going to force it on uh, California employees, state employees and healthcare workers. And he didn't call it a vaccine passport. He called it electronic credential system, something to that nature. Jazzed it up it's, with a nice title. Yeah, yeah, we'll just change the words around. It's so disturbing. And all that. I did think that I would see stuff like this happen in my lifetime. I just thought that it was 20, 30 years down the road. I didn't think that it was this soon. Yeah. So at this point, it's like, I suspect anything and everything. Nothing will shock me from here on out. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think has been the, the worst thing that we've dealt with in this, in, I would say, in the past year? Man, it's like everything is like a top that kind of contest. Uh, yeah. I mean, lockdowns, lockdowns were, in my mind, the very worst. But now if we're getting forced medical procedures put on us, that I think is going to be worse than lockdowns. I'm pretty vocal about like that I can't do, I can't take the vaccine. Mm -hmm. I have Crohn's disease and my specialist, not a random doctor on the internet, like specialist that I'd seen for years, had warned me like you can't get vaccinations i don't really get sick the rest of the time you know like i got my gi tract issues but i don't really catch stuff but they're like well yeah you know that's 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 different you know like injecting something into your body could cause blah 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 you know so if i raise this point to any of my progressive friends who are pro mandatory vaccination what do they do they just openly ridicule me and say i'm lying so i don't there's no due process I don't think that there's any regard for our actual health in this. Like, this is just like this insane, like mob rule thing based on 
I don't know, I guess initially like fear mongering and scare tactics, but I don't really know what to call it now. Yeah, well, I, can, I can, I can attest that, uh, I can attest that my doctor who's, you know, again, not an internet doctor or anything. Um, he's been the doctor that I've had for the past uh, five years, I think. Um, w my last appointment with him, he brought up, uh, he brought up the COVID vaccine and asked if I had gotten it. And, you know, I was like, you know, doc, I'm not, I don't want to have this discussion or whatever. And he said straight up, he said, I don't think that you need it per se, but I think that you need it just for the variance issue. And I'm like, I don't like, I'm not going to have this discussion. Like right. you can bring it up. You can say your piece. I'm going to do what I'm going to do. If, if, if I get it, it's my choice. If I don't get it, it's my choice. You know, I don't even think it needs to be part of this discussion. And, but I just, it shocked me that he was like, well, I don't even think that you need to get it. I just think it's because, you know, the, the variance issue, that's the big thing. You need to get it because of the variance. We want to put a quell on them. And I'm like, not sure that that's working out. No, it's apparently, according to mainstream news sources, it's not working out at all. So the whole thing is just like this hideous web of lies. And every time we get new data that really just like blows a hole in the mainstream narrative, the mainstream people, you know, diehard progressives, they just cover their eyes and they just reject the truth. And they say, that doesn't matter. You should still get it. It's like, it's difficult to figure out, you know, like how to approach that because we're living in two different like realities. Yeah. Yeah, I would. Yeah, because it, it the, what, what gets this is what gets me the most when I when I talk about this. And now that Joe Biden has come out and and made this mandate on the federal level for the civilian employees. I've I've said every step of the way on this, that uh, that you're, you're not really going to encourage anybody who's on the fence. By sticking to your guns on. You know, this is what we got to do, or we're going to go back to mask mandates or lockdowns right. or, uh, or, you know, vaccine identification, you know, in public passports or electronic ID system, whatever. You can jazz it up however you want. But th they, they have not been encouraging. And these are the same people that prior to their election, when Donald Trump was in the hot seat, mm -hmm. they were asked. Hey, um, the vaccine looks like it's about to come out. Uh, will you take it? And they were all, I'm not so sure I would take it under Trump. It needs to be, it needs to be subject to more testing and, and we need to be sure. And then suddenly once they're elected, oh, hey, all the data's here, you know, yep. uh, everybody should get it. Everybody should get it and forget about what we said two months ago because now it's different. Yeah. And then we have it jazzed up with, you know, Fauci saying, you know, the science didn't change. We didn't change. You know, the, the data changed. I'm not, it's, I, I, I don't know. It's what like, changed. it's like straight out of 1984. Like war is, you know, like it feels like a tagline out of a dystopian sci-fi novel. We are, that's what we're living in right now. That's, that's our reality. The other thing that it really seems to me like is revenge on conservatives. We had, you know, the, the, the insurrection at the Capitol and a lot of those people, you know, like it's people on the right who are largely the ones opposing vaccinations, you know, just leaving libertarians out of this for the sake of argument mm -hmm. and people on the left who are pushing it and the people on the right were out of bounds, you know, for contesting what they believe was a stolen election. So let's screw them over and punish them by, by forcing them to take our medicine or get kicked out of society. That's what it looks like to me. It looks like a revenge strategy. Hmm. No, I never sat back and considered it that way. You did bring up January 6th though, so everybody needs to check off their bingo cards. That, yes. That January, January 6th, 6th was mentioned and that whatever you're going to mention, January 6th was probably worse than whatever it is you're gonna bring up. Yes, yes, literally, literally worse than war and, um, you know, death and dying, the, the furry insurrection, the velvet rope tour. I just, uh, 
doesn't it, doesn't it, I don't know, what kind of a reaction does it elicit in you when you read about reporters on Twitter saying that they have PTSD from seeing a protest at the White House, but nothing similar uh, regarding all the protesting that happened over the summer? See, uh, I, I'm very, I'm very mixed. Um, you know, I, you know, to me, I just can't with the overdramatic angles. All right, with, yeah. with Congress people crying on television uh, about all that, like I'm like, stop! Somebody make it stop, please, please, just pause. No, but uh, and then there's also this like, uh, there's this very very odd sense of like hero self heroizing. Um, yeah, because I forget there was one representative who he's donated like the suit that he wore that day to the Smithsonian, and I'm like. For what? I hope a bonfire to be lit on fire. Yeah, like I can't imagine. Yeah, he had a I whole, can't, I forget who it was too, but he had a whole tweet thread with his picture about how he was donating to the Smithsonian because we can never forget January 6th, the darkest day since the Civil War in American history. Is that the only protest that's ever happened at the Capitol building? That, uh, well, I mean, you know, it depends on who you want to go with. Right, right, right. I mean, they're all mostly peaceful. I'll give them that. Mostly peaceful. But I, I wonder if that's the only protest that's ever actually happened at the Capitol building and if those are the only reporters to ever cover a protest in Washington, D.C. I'm, I'm skeptical. I'm skeptical. I, you know, I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not a violent person, but when I hear uh, these reporters say that it was worse than 9-11, it does make me want to throw them out of a burning skyscraper. It really does. That's the, that's the feeling that it elicits in me. Yeah, I mean, I mean that, that's just, I, don't, I, I feel like almost that we can't have an honest conversation about anything anymore yep. because everybody is just, to, this is how I see it. I feel like everybody is desperate for having their historic relevant moment and it has to be documented. They have to tweet about it. They have to, you know, do TikToks on it and all that other jazz because they need that sense of, of like this self sense of worth. In yeah. The world. And I don't, yeah, it's like, I don't get it. It's like these people don't know why they're alive. They don't know what their purpose is. They don't know what they're living for, which is why I think libertarianism is so phenomenal because it's, you know, it's this political movement, but it's also this philosophical movement. Most of us have like a deep respect for our individual rights. We live purpose-driven lives, but other people, a lot of these reactionary progressives, they don't have that. They're not grounded in first principles. They don't understand what rights are. They, it's if they weren't actively trying to, you know, make me a second class citizen in their medical caste system and call me a bioterrorist, then I would, you know, have compassion for them. But I'm at a place now where I'm just starting to become very emotionally removed from, from the plight of the people who want to ruin my life. Yeah. And, and that's the other thing is that everybody, it, it's always such a tear down. Like you can't have a dialogue with, with people mm -hmm. anymore. It's all, it's always, it, it always goes down to this ridicule, this mocking, this outcasting. And then when they outcast you, they wonder why you act like an outcast. Right. And it's right. like, well, well, it, it shouldn't even be up for discussion. <laughs> oh yeah. And, and they don't want to have civil discussions. There was some, I don't know, random freak show, tweeting at me today about something that he was mad about, you know, and I was like, would you, where, what area do you live in? I'm in LA. Would you like to have an in-person conversation? Why don't we like discuss this like adults? I think I just got blocked. Yeah. Like, and that's, you know, like that's one social media interaction, but that's how people behave on social media. And it's how a lot of people behave in person. Like I've had people, you know, scream at me to put on a mask from across the street outdoors in LA. And they don't want to have a conversation. Trust me, like when I try to engage with them politely, whatever, cordially, you know, like why? All I get is just screeching. Like it, I'm embarrassed for them with the way that they behave. Yeah, yeah. We're definitely not, 
communicating very well as a society anymore. So sad. It is. Well, maybe we can rebuild. I really think that that's the one of the many purposes of the Libertarian Party is this concept of the remnant that Ron Paul talks about, which is when everything is burned down and just destroyed by the powers that be, you need a good solid group of people to build back who have a sense of community, who understand the difference between right and wrong. And I think yeah. that's what that's what our purpose is. You know, that's what we're doing here. Yeah. No, I would I would very much argue that uh, that probably the biggest problem in America is that there is no sense of community anymore. Everybody has kind yeah. of passed that on to the government. And I've yeah. always I've always been, you know, the government's not your community. Your government, right. you, you can say, you know, that you've elected these people and that they are from the community. But the way that I've always seen politicians in the government is in a bubble world of their own above everybody else. Yeah. There's there's so, everybody else yeah. and the political class and the political, the political class. yeah, political class. Yeah, they I, don't have to abide by the rules that they're setting. I don't think of bureaucrats and politicians as part of my community. No. The people I interact with on a regular basis, the people who help me out if I'm sick or I'm struggling or whatever, and the people that I help out and the, the people that I've fostered real relationships with, that's my community. It is a very strange concept to think that the state is replacing like family and community. But it, but it is, you know, I think that the state has worked really hard to try to replace fathers in the home. And that's why, you know, child support and alimony is such a contentious thing. And the, the state is aware of that and they weaponize it against families. And I think that they're going to probably try to replace mothers now too. And now we've got, you know, what women who are going to be signed up for the draft. That's super gross. That is super disturbing. That was a great piece of woke news when that when that one dropped. I was yeah. like, I was like, people are going to be happy about this instead of I don't know, arguing that maybe a draft shouldn't exist. Yeah, that that freaks me out. That really disturbs me. But it's just par for the course. Just like the woke CIA ads and everything else, you know. Like, oh, I am a minority at the CIA with a panic disorder. Yay, CIA! No, that's good grief it's like 20 different ways to take that apart and not celebrate any of that as a success jeez mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so i i agree that building a community or building that sense of community back in, in american culture is, is a very important thing and it starts on a very very small scale and and, and the biggest example that i give to people is the fact that i i just recently moved like I've only been in my new place for about three months, but uh, my old neighborhood that I lived in for five years, I knew exactly two neighbors, right. the rest of them were strangers, barely interacted at all. I've been here for three months. Yeah. I don't know the neighbors that well, but like, at least we wave at each other and say yeah. hi and stuff. And, and this is a, significantly smaller neighborhood you know people keep to themselves they're not up in each other's business everybody's kind of like you know yeah that's their property they're doing their thing they're not bothering everybody anybody and that's 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 great that's what i want that's what i want because my old community you had I, you had next door neighbors that were calling code enforcement anonymously just to fuck with you and oh that sounds very la yeah very la yeah it uh i had it was the worst experience uh, for my wife and I and my family. And, and I really, I really, it was really eating at my head after my daughter was born because she, you know, she's about to turn two in September. And I was just like, this isn't what, this is not what I want her growing up in. I don't want her growing up right. in, you know, this, this cramped neighborhood where nobody really acknowledges anybody else you know, and there's no conversation, there's no friendliness, there's no, you know, concern. Whereas I'm in this neighborhood, nobody drives through this neighborhood, it's not like a through fare. So cars ain't buzzing through the neighborhood at random. So if my daughter goes running out in the road, these guys that are driving, you know, 
from their house or whatever. They, they already know that there's people here with kids. They drive slow. They're courteous. They're yeah. paying attention to those things. Whereas my old neighborhood, people are just cutting through because, you know, screw it. This roadway will get me to that roadway faster. I don't care whose neighborhood it is. Right, right. So we got to, yeah, we got to build back that sense of community. It's a really good point. I try to say hello to my neighbors in the hallway, the elevator outside as, as often as I can. I don't know them really well, but you know, it's like if a package gets misdelivered, mm -hmm. none of us are thinking like someone stole it. Like we're all, you know, cordial to each other, which is much better than it was when I was living in, uh, you know, really close to downtown LA. I had good, I had good community with my immediate neighbors, but just the track record in general is, is really rough. Like it's, it's like the concept of Ano me. Like there's so many of us, you know, and we're all just sort of faceless strangers, you know, just kind of passing each other by. Yeah. It's not a good way to live. It's got to be really challenging for people who move into new communities who are single. It yeah. sounds like yours worked out, you know, but you you have the, the family with you, which is great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So in building these communities, though, I mean, you obviously you're with me on this. That that's a people mm -hmm. thing. That that starts yes. with you and me and and individuals, not a government entity trying to do it, but yep. daily interactions. How can we build that up amongst people? I mean, like for me, I, I'm much like you. Like I will try to reach out. And I'm a shy, uh, believe it or not, people, I'm shy. I'm a shy dude. I'm quiet. Uh, even though I can be loud and bombastic behind a microphone on a computer, it's a lot different than, than going out and interacting with people. I, I could be shy and I have to sometimes force myself to, you know, just, just get over a sense of fear or whatever and, and reach out and put myself out there. But every time I do it, I feel better because at least, even if the results weren't good, at least I put that step forward. I put forward the effort to try to do it. Yeah, I noticed you were a little bit quiet when we met in Delaware. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, I was like flipping out and screaming at the delegation. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but that's what I have to do. I have to defend the people who are a little bit shy or hesitant to speak up. I think one of the best ways to start community, like if you don't know how, or you're not really sure how to approach it in your area is to find something that people can rally behind like a common interest. Mm -hmm. And that could be anything. It doesn't have to be political. It could be, you know, baking. It could be like a gardening group. It, it, there's all kinds of stuff. Like one thing in LA that's really cool is people will come together completely, you know, like aside from politics and work on rehabilitating like an abandoned lot and try to clean up the trash or grow a little garden there. And who knows what'll happen, right? Like we don't know if the property is condemned and it's gonna get, you know, reclaimed by the state or if owners, somebody's gonna buy it, you know, but you just put in what you can to make it nicer. And maybe you have a vegetable garden for a few months. And that's like a really cool thing, you know, that you can work on as a community without having to argue about politics or without really getting in, you know, I guess in people's business too much, like you get to know people on your own terms. Yeah. Stuff like that, you know, I recommend shooting groups for areas that are interested in that. I think that's a great thing to do, teaching people gun safety. Yeah. So many good ideas and obviously mutual aid. Like I'm a big fan of Liberty Memes $5 Charity Club. Have you seen that on, on Facebook? No, I have not. Okay, it's this really great like libertarian mutual aid society. Then uh, the admin, I think his name is David. He posts a cause in the group and everybody tries to contribute at least five bucks until someone's medical bills are paid. Like a lot of it's medical bills or uh, you know, someone who their car broke or they are having trouble paying their bills in college. It's really cool. It's basically a libertarian mutual aid society. We need to bring that stuff back too. That's pretty cool. And I, I think this, this goes into a deeper discussion that I'm not going to make us go into. Um, but I think a lot of people have this sense that uh, because like, you know, religion and, and church ownership has like, you know, waned down a little bit that they put that on the churches. But like, I, I don't think people are thinking outside the box that you don't need a church to to be charitable. You don't, you don't right. need a church driving. You could, you could in effect argue 
and just replace the state with the church and 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 you could make them synonymous on some of this stuff you don't yeah. need them you don't need this this other organization to come together as a community or as people to to do these kind of things and with things like the internet you can have a much more vast reach than you ever could before yeah and mutual aid societies were much more prevalent before people started getting taxed to get to death uh, that's where people put their money you know when they wanted to help people but now we all hear like oh uh, the, 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 there's a government program for that there's this there's that you know, we can just fall back on, oh, whatever, you know, my tax dollars paid for that. I don't have to think about it. And that just makes us all just like anonymous strangers and we don't care about each other. It's, there's a lot more meaning behind it when you knowingly donate to someone to help that individual. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, one of the biggest, one of the biggest things that drove me into uh, libertarianism is this specific conversation on charity uh, Penn Gillette, who, I mean, right now he might not be, you know, sure. happy go lucky libertarian at, at, like he was, but, uh, I, he, he spoke very passionately about how taxation is not charity, um, and how the government doing something on your behalf isn't charity. It's not you, right. like you're not contributing to a charity in that sense. Uh, that, that is not charitable. That is not, you, you have passed the problem off essentially you've 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 uh consented to the taxes that are just being grifted from you to say okay well at least it's not my problem right and and it's not like the government does a good job at any of this stuff either we've got close to a hundred thousand homeless people in los angeles county yeah that's that's insane that i mean i don't know what, what size of the town you live in but can you imagine if you took all the homeless people out of LA and made the, their own city, a hundred thousand, that's a that's, huge, so I don't want to hear about how the government is doing a good job with our tax dollars. Like it's a colossal failure. And this is also interesting because uh, in talking with like my, some of my friends who don't understand libertarianism or, or haven't looked into it or asked me questions about it. A lot of times when it comes up, you know, uh, about libertarianism, having limited government, or no government in some senses, uh, they always ask, they always ask about like, you know, well, what about the homeless people? And I'm like, well, I mean, what about what, what, what's being done now? Right. So what's the libertarian, like what's a libertarian approach to tackling like a homelessness issue? Man, it's really complex. I've spent several years volunteering with, with homeless people on Skid Row in downtown LA. So I've gotten, I completely changed, it completely changed my opinion on how to help homeless people. I think that the most important thing that you can do for a homeless person is to give them human contact. It's not free stuff. Yeah. People need to be rehabilitated first and foremost and treated like human beings and made to feel that they have intrinsic value and not treated like animals. And that is what a lot of these programs do. And it's also what a lot of large nonprofit groups do. We call it the homeless industrial complex in LA. First and foremost is to just to like rehumanize people. And, the, and you wanna give them dignity and something that they can work for, like goals to work towards. Because when you just hand everything out, it doesn't increase someone's self-esteem and it doesn't give them any purpose in life. And a lot of these places that are designed for, for homeless people to live in are pretty, pretty low standards of living. And I think that that's fine as a place to start because you know it's like an emergency, a crisis. I just need a roof over my head. Mm -hmm. But when you couple that with a $900 a month incentive, or sometimes it's not even that much, sometimes it's $221 in food stamps and a couple hundred bucks in petty cash, and and then you tell them if you try to get a job you can't have this free stuff anymore it basically makes them fearful because there is no there's no wiggle room it's not okay get a job for three months once you hold your job for three months then we'll phase out your entitlements it's just all or nothing so the end result is that people feel that they can't accomplish or achieve anything it's too much of a risk they'll just sit, sit at home 
in this like miserable concrete box with a bunch of other formerly homeless people live off of subsidies, a substandard diet and have like a miserable existence. And that's, I think that's like a, it's like an anti-human way to approach homelessness outreach. Libertarians know that people need to be treated like individuals, you know, and that there is no one size fits all program. And that's why so many of these people also just like they they fail in these programs and end up back on the street because it's just a profoundly dehumanizing experience. Yeah, no, I 100 percent. I agree with that. So, Angela, you're running for LNC chair that what that comes up in 2022, correct? Yeah, in Reno Memorial Day weekend in May. Okay, that's where it's going down. So you've uh, obviously the groundwork you're laying out now going to state conventions and showing up at state conventions is is a big deal for for people out there wondering because uh, Joseph Bishop Henchman hasn't well when he was leading the party uh, he was not necessarily attending everyone he was doing videos and all this stuff and yeah. I, I I was I was off put and discouraged by that um, to see that uh, that current see somebody in the current chair not um going the extra mile and then seeing people who you know aren't in those positions but they're doing it anyway they're going out of their way to go to these conventions to be there to be a resource to to be a wealth of knowledge to spread that to help people you know i i think it's a very a a tale of two very different schools of thought on how to how to advance the Libertarian Party from the National Committee down to the states. Yes. Yes. Uh, so it's interesting. You know, I wish that we were in a place as a party where it wasn't such a big deal to skip state conventions, but we're not there yet. And when I visit a lot of state conventions, not all, but some of them have very low attendance and uh, they're regrowing themselves, but they've struggled historically. Not everybody in attendance has a good grasp of Robert's rules of order. They don't know how to conduct business very well. And the role of the state chair should be to help. Not to take over the state you know, business, but if somebody has a question, if they're not sure about something, like you should be there to facilitate and, and be a support for them. That's, that's been a role that I've played at a lot of conventions when you have new people who don't know how business works and they have other questions or they need help, you know, and, and they want to gr- drive growth. Going as a state chair, like, kind of boosts attendance. So I would like to see more of that happen. And also you learn about important issues, like what's important to the state party, mm-hmm. because the national party should be supporting state parties. So whatever the gun issue is in Delaware, you know, go, if you're the state chair, find out about it, communicate that to the national social media and, and get that get that out there so people are made aware of it, you know, do a press release, whatever. It really bothered me when I visited Alabama and there was an activist who's really passionate about initiatives and referendums. Half of the state doesn't have a right to, to basically get get an initiative on the ballot if it's something that they want to pass, which to me, I, you know, I live in California, so I think that's weird. I'm like, what? But if we're mad about something, we just petition and we put it on the ballot and we vote on it. Well, in Alabama, they can't do that. And that's the case in like 24 states. And when this activist asked the former chair, Joe Bishop Henchman, like what he thought about that and how important it was, and can he make it a national issue? He said, no, that's a state issue. It's like, yeah. come on, dude. No, it's not. If half the country is complaining about it, it's not a state issue. It's a, it's a national issue. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, yeah. So that's, that's some of my, you know, grievances about how chairs have treated state parties in the past. We really, state parties are more important as far as like the groundwork for activism goes than the national party. The national party's role should be to help them, you know, you're like providing resources almost. Providing or, or resources, guidance. giving them, you know, like a signal boost when something serious is going on, elevating it to the level, you know, that it should be at, like when it should get national attention. Yeah, no, 100%. Absolutely. 
Absolutely. So what are your plans between now and then? Is it just continue on this, uh, this, this tour to different states and the state conventions and connecting with people and meeting with them? Yes. Well, yeah, so many things, so many plans. I have been working to get screenings of the Mises Caucus documentary, The Unseen, and I'm going to be getting that out to as many state conventions as I can. It's a 30 minute uh, short documentary on businesses that were uh, damaged by lockdowns in California. It's really good. Oh yeah. I'll be attending the Libertarian Party 50th anniversary event in Colorado next month and some national level trainings and probably the Montana convention. I believe that's in September. So yeah, I've got, I've got some stuff happening. And then most of the other conventions are gonna be next spring, but there are a few that happen in uh, January and February. Yeah. All right. Well, there you have it, Libertarians. If you haven't had your state convention yet, you can probably expect to see Angela McArdle there. Yes. I'm making it to as many as possible. It sucks when some of them are on the same weekend, so I can't attend them all, but I am willing to do like a video statement or send a training or just do anything I can to help people if I can't physically attend. Nah, that's great. That's great. Cause we definitely need an injection at the national committee level and just, yeah. just a complete overhaul and, and redirection. Yeah. Well, Angela, I've had you for nearly an hour now, so let's get ready to wrap this up. Where, at least, where can everybody find you online? Where can we find you online? Well, you can find me on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram, Angela McArdle. I'm, I'm pretty easy to find. And if you want to follow the work that I'm doing, see the affiliate building program I put out and see what I'm talking about at conventions and other speaking engagements, you can support me on Patreon. I think it's patreon.com slash Angela McArdle. And then I also post updates on my website, AngelaMcArdle.com. Awesome. Well, Angela, thanks for coming on for a second time on the Fritzcast. And I can guarantee that we're going to be having a third time. And I think the third time it's going to be when you're chair. Yeah. Thanks for having me back. And thanks for the work that you've been putting in in Delaware. It really means a lot when we see people who have podcasts and a public presence, like actually get involved in their state parties. It's really encouraging. Yeah. I'm hoping to encourage more people to do it. All right. And that's going to do it. Angela McArdle for the second time on Fritzcast. Let's make it a third time with her as Libertarian National Committee Chair. Let's make it happen, people. If, if your state uh, hasn't had the uh, their Libertarian Party convention, keep your eyes peeled. Go to it. Check, see if Angela's there. Reach out to her. Connect with her. Um, support her. And really support overall the change that needs to happen within the Libertarian National Party. Uh, that's going to do it for me. So you can follow me at FritzQS on Twitter, Facebook.com slash the FritzCast. It's Instagram. We're FritzCast on Instagram. If you're watching on YouTube, you're already there. If you want to go watch on YouTube, search FritzCast, you'll get it. And you can even, I kind of hate admitting this part, you can even search FritzCast on TikTok now, where I do do some podcast highlights and other goofy stuff and, and you know, stupid goofy stuff uh, on there. So it's on TikTok. You can find it. FritzCast is on TikTok. Yay. Yay. But remember, I love you guys. And next week, we'll be back. Uh, as of right now, don't have a guest scheduled, but we might be having one down the pike. Love you guys. See you next week.